Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the esophagus and EG junction for the AJCC 8th edition, which represents changes from what I think was a pretty radical uh, departure from AJC 6 to 7th, and then we tried to make improvements from 7 to 8. So my disclosure is that I was the lead, uh, co-lead along with Dave Kelson for the upper GI group. So what you see is a little bit of a manifestation of how we were hurting that group. Um, so any uh, darts, you can probably start getting out just about now. So important criteria for staging. You know, the TNM classification was not just recently invented. This has been going on for greater than 50 years. Initially, it was developed as a classification scheme so that we could have a discussion about anatomic variability of different tumors. So the TNM classification is what the clinician is recording in terms of what's going on with the tumor, and the staging system is what is supposed to, to correlate to prognosis. Um, and I'm going to reiterate a little bit of what Frank said, but uh, we have some departure in terms of our understanding. So in terms of what we use staging systems for is that we have to communicate amongst one another about similarly typed tumors or similarly TNM classified tumors. And then above and beyond that, there may be differences in prognosis. Furthermore, staging systems should be somewhat predictive. In other words, how you're using that information should be predictive about how you come into clinic uh, and prescribe therapy. So if you're using a pathologic staging system to, pr to provide recommendations for therapy, the pathologic staging system has to somewhat replicate what's happening in the clinic. Some fundamentals about stage grouping. When you do stage group, these are the laws of stage grouping. They should be monotonic monotonically decreasing. They should be distinctive and homogeneous, and those are the rules. Um, and you'll see in this situation that monotonic monotonically decreasing means it goes from stage one to two to three, and it's in order. Distinctive means that they don't cross over. You'll see in this situation, this is an example of what we did for the post knee adjuvant therapy, YPTNM, that up at the top you see very monotonic, distinctive survival curves, but we had to make an exception for the things down below. They cross over at, th at the three, excuse me, 4B and 4A, which means they're non distinctive and they're not monotonic at the bottom. So there had to be some compromises, basically. So the main analytic goals of what we did for the 8th edition is that we had to determine if clinical, pathologic, and neoadjuvant TNM systems could be shared. Um, historically, the clinical TNM system was simply a reiteration of the pathologic TNM. Uh, we needed to validate a larger data set because the WEC data went from about 4,000 patients to over 25,000, and then consider whether there were current non-anatomic variables that should be included into an anatomic staging system. So this is what the WEC data looked like. There was uh, data from all over the world. Ultimately, uh, there were 22,000 evaluable patients. The difference between this database and what went into the AJC 7th edition is that the AJC 7th was purely pathologic staging. It was only 4,000 patients, mostly from US and Europe. Um, you see that there is a definite lack in Asia, even in the last data set and this data set for crossover with Japan. There were no clinically staged patients in the last database. I'm not saying that this database is perfect, and I'm hoping that someone in the audience is going to probe me at the time of questions about this data and the weaknesses and biases. So um, that data was put into a machine, and um, just in case some of you think that I'm smarter than I am, this was not me that did this. Hemant Ishwaran and Eugene Blackstone were the drivers behind the statistics for this uh, stage grouping. They risk-adjusted uh, 39 variables that were included in the database. They plotted those out, each individual, individually, as to how that individual variable would affect overall staging. And using a random forest uh, analysis technique, which was computerized, we were able to figure out which variables were important in terms of in individual stage groupings. From that, they went through a three-step random forest analysis, and from individual pace, uh, patient risk-adjusted survival, they create clusters, trying to separate survival curves by more or less 5% so that you have a relatively homogeneous group of patients and you're not having a lot of heterogeneity within one stage group. The curves are labeled by non-anatomic and TNM and coalesce around the curves, and then we would confirm heterogeneity. And then a fourth step was the committee. The committee was created, we looked at the data, and then had to decide, does this make sense clinically? Is this the kind of staging system that we want to put out and put our names on? So the committee had to get together and look at the data-driven uh, staging and then also make exceptions based on staging rules and what the clinical relevance was. So the good news is, is that in terms of category changes, there's very few changes that you have to adapt to from, from AJC 7 to 8. 
Uh, T1, we've always been using T1A and B, but that was finally incorporated into the staging system. T4A and B was incorporated in, to include peritoneum and pleura. No changes in N and M. Um, grade, we simplified. And location, um, we made that coalesce with uh, what made sense in terms of the clinic. Regional lymph nodes, that was actually um, nicely simplified from AJC 6 to 7. You remember it was usually used to be based on location of the tumor. It was very difficult to understand, and, and I think that there was a lot of misunderstanding in the literature. So finally in 7, uh, Tom Rice got to, together with Blackstone and looked at all the regional lymph nodes and basically said everything that was a lymph node from the neck that was periesophageal, and I don't mean up high in the neck, but periesophageal, basically just supraclavicular down to the celiac node was considered regional, and that was regardless of the location of the tumor. And then for the eighth edition, there was also this level eight, which we have been talking about for years, is the periesophageal lymph nodes, but level eight up at the neck versus level eight down at the diaphragm was not delineated, so we put together an eight with a, s a subscript, which is eight upper, eight middle, and eight lower. Uh, to go along with it. So regional lymph nodes, everything from supraclavicular, parasophageal down to celiac axis, and then the redistribution or reclassification of eight. Histologic grade was simplified. It uh, has detailed criteria for both squame and, uh, and adeno that's in the uh, book. It's based on the College of American Pathologists, so you can read that as necessary. We did eliminate G4 undifferentiated tumors because too many people were putting in G4s when they couldn't make a decision and an undifferentiated tumor could either be squame or could be adeno. So G4 was eliminated. We also have tried to discourage GX. So GX we would like to eliminate altogether because grade has been determined to be a significant prognostic driver of um, overall survival as seen by the well-differentiated deeper tumors or the poorly differentiated superficial tumors. Tumor location, um, we changed that around. So instead of looking at the top of the tumor as being the measuring point, it was the epicenter of the tumor. Um, and it didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense for us to be describing an upper esophageal tumor if the tumor touched 20 centimeters, but it went all the way down to 30 or 35. So instead of calling that an upper tumor, uh, you would base it on the epicenter. Furthermore, there was criteria based on what we are considering EG junction versus gastric. We currently don't have harmony in terms of how we treat gastric tumors or how we treat GE junction tumors. In fact, the NCCN guidelines for gastric tumors would indicate those patients that have cardiac tumors are both staged differently and treated differently. They get a different dose of radiation, they have a different operation, they have different, different staging systems. So we had to go through um, an episode of, of delineating um, some dividing line between uh, where the gastric cardia was actually a cardia tumor or where that was an EG junction tumor. Previously, Tom had been very successful in garnering type 1, 2s, and 3s all the way into this chapter, in the EG junction um, chapter. Um, but there has been a lot of pushback from the Asian groups and from the UICC for harmony and putting cardia tumors back in with the stomach. So we had to reach an agreement that if the tumor had an epicenter of less than or two equal, uh, less than or equal to two centimeters from the cardia, that would be staged in the esophagus. If it was essentially a type three tumor, it was greater than or uh, greater than two centimeters into the cardia, um, it was going to be staged as a stomach. Now this generated a lot of phone calls and a couple um, flights for me, so we had to go through this because there was people who didn't understand this, and I think it's pretty basic for the crowd that I have today. But in, if you look at example B. This is not a GE junction tumor. It's not touching the GE junction. Even though it's within two centimeters of the cardia, it's not touching the GE junction. This is staged as a gastric cancer. If it's a tumor that's into the gastric uh, junction, the GE junction, but the epicenter is less than two centimeters, this is staged. This is a type three staged as a gastric cancer. However, anything with the epicenter within two centimeters of this GE junction, this is all staged. This is us. This is the type, classic type two tumor. Okay, so that was the easy stuff. The anatomic stuff that we have conversations about every day, that was the easy stuff. And I think that if we as clinicians keep it simple, if we do a good job of documenting on chart what the T, N, and M is, then the staging comes later. That can either be computerized or we can do our best to get at that at a later junction with coding. But our job is to make sure we have accurate T, N, and M. Now it comes down to what we're doing in terms of predictability and prognosis. And that comes into system changes. And so we have carried over from AJCC 7th edition that both adeno and squamous cell cancers are different tumors and they need to be staged differently. 
So that set up two different staging classification schemes for esophageal cancer. And then it turns out that the survival uh, and prognosis for these for these patients based on clinical, pathologic, and YPT in them was all distinct as well. So that means that you could probably get your gun out now because that means that there's six different staging schemes for esophageal cancer. And that's the bad news, but the good news is that you're not gonna be using all six systems. So in the past, pathologic staging system is basically of historical interest. You know, we're not taking patients with T3, N1, or N2 tumors to surgery. That's what the, all that pathologic data is based on. The AJCC WEC data is based on tumors that were resected as far back as 1970-something. So in this day and age, we're using clinical and YP as our staging system. Those are the two that we're going to be dealing with in the, in the clinics. And let me just describe that a little bit. So we know that histologic cell type is an important prognostic factor. We have the TCA, G, TCGA Genome Project. Uh, we know that they're genomically distinct and their prognosis is different. So it made sense for squames and adenos to be separated. Uh, we also used the larger 8th edition WEC data to prove that and to validate that there was better separation between those, sta those staging classification systems. Um, similarly grouped patients with squam do worse than adeno, except for some advanced cancers and they all kind of, kind of common. And then finally, something that we need to know as a rule, if it's an adeno squame, it's going to be um, it's going to be staged as a squame. So if you go back and look at the AJCC book, uh, we're not the first ones to consider separating a clinical TNM from a YP TNM. In fact, this again generated a lot of phone calls. Clinical TNM and YP, or excuse me, clinical TNM and pathologic TNM have always existed. However, they weren't always necessarily different systems. And it was always a, an iteration or a carryover for the pathologic TNM. We just assumed it was the same, but they're not. And so it became clear that if you were to look at the stage groups, which I'll show you, that there was, there's, we're over iterating or over, um, we're over um, estimating what their survival is going to be, and therefore making decisions in the clinic that may not be accurate. And then it was a groundbreaking for us to consider putting in a neoadjuvant staging system because there's been a lot of papers, as you, as you all know, based on how the patients do after downstaging with neoadjuvant therapy. So to consider a separate staging group of YP versus P or C was considered groundbreaking and, and took a little bit of work. So here's what clinical TNM's uh, staging system looks like for um, squame. And you notice that there's a fairly uh, nice monotonic decrease. But if you look at five years, the overall five-year survival for a clinical TNM at stage one and zero is only at 50%. And then as you get lower, you know, you come down to 20% or lower. But if you look at the pathologic staging system of say, a pathologic 1A, you're looking at something closer to 70 or 80 percent for overall survival, indicating that we're severely overestimating what their survival is in the clinic if we were using a pathologic staging system. So if you came into the clinic and I said, you're a stage 1, and I looked at the pathologic staging scheme, that's what we're basing our staging system on, I said, you have an 80 percent overall survival. Well, that's not true at all. And it had nothing to do with what was going on in reality, and it probably has a lot to do with the fact that our staging systems are just not that discrete and they're inadequate. Similarly with YP, the YP staging system was far lower than what it was for pathologic. So even though the patients are downstaged, there's many papers, including one that I you know, have published, saying that in a downstage situation, it's similar to what it would have been in a clinical or pathologic. But when we looked at it on a worldwide basis, it wasn't even close. Adenocarcinoma does the same thing, but to a lesser extent. The clinical staging for adenocarcinoma grossly overestimated the patient's survival compared to what it was pathologically, especially in the lower stage groups from 2 uh, down to 4A. And then YP, again, doesn't even reflect what was going on with the pathologic staging system. So what you need to know is that from a standpoint of clinical prognostic stage groupings, the histologies uh, that are based on TN and M, even though in the pathologic staging system, if you remember from the seventh edition, that grade and location played a large role, it's very confusing. You don't need to remember that. You know, you're seeing these patients in the clinic, it's just straight TN and M. Grade and location is only used in the pathologic staging system, as you can see here. And it's true for both squame and adeno. Now, location isn't used in for, for adeno, but it is for squame. And there were a lot of conversations that went around about this, but it was clearly uh, putting in different prognosis and changing around the stage groupings. For the YP stage groups, um, here's another 
area of good news for you, the YPTNM for Squam and for Adenor are the same. They actually, they almost overlapped. So this is an area where we could use the same staging system, YP, Squam. And so all you have to remember at this point is clinical Squam, clinical Adeno, and YPTNM for both. Again, you we're only using anatomic staging criteria because that's what was relevant based on the data, and grade and location we're not, we're not utilizing and assigning stage groups. So in summary, this is what the clinical stage groupings look like. And I want to point out a couple things here. So um, one of the things that we set out to try to do at the beginning was to say, well, based on what a clinical stage grouping would be, let's, let's make decisions on how we decide in multi multidisciplinary clinic. We basically delineate patients who go to knee adjuvant therapy based on nodal positivity or advanced depth of disease. And so maybe we could set up a system that was a clinical N positive versus N zero. Well, when we actually started looking at the data, at least this data set, if you, if you did that, you have you know, patients that are T1 down to T3, N1, and significantly different prognosis and potentially making different decisions about therapy compared to an N2 or an N3. And this is squame. It's even more pronounced in the adenocarcinoma group, which is the one that we're more commonly treating in the Western civilizations, which is that patients that are T2N1 or T1N1 or 2A all the way over, almost immediately at N2 and N3, you're looking at 4A disease, which you saw before in my curves, which are survivals of ranging around 15%. And then the YP, this is based almost primarily both on pathologic and, um, and clinical staging, so you're seeing that there's a very quick move from looking like you're a stage one over to stage three, there's, there's a very small group that are doing it as intermediate survival. So this reflects that patients that are going through knee adjuvant therapy are locally advanced, that this is a dangerous disease and we're moving from stage one over to stage three and four A very quickly. So to make things simpler, um, there is an app, my nurse showed me this about two weeks ago and I've been super happy about this because it's a staging system that I worked on for years and I can't remember all the components of it and so I was having to carry a card around. So there's an app that you can get, you can download from the ISLC which is, looks like this, pay no attention to these games because you know this is something that is, you know, you know it's on an institutional iPhone so we don't need to worry about those things. <laughs> um, this uh, staging atlas looks like this, and you can pull up the different chapters. Now, this doesn't have every chapter for AJCC, but this is the ones that the ISLC are con concerned with. So this has the esophago, gastric, and lung. So this is a great staging app to use. The eventuality of prognosis, and this is what Frank was talking about before, is that when we get more and more of these variables and improve our databases, I would suspect that we will be carrying around an app on our iPhones that you would plug in 10, 15, 20 different variables, and that would be how we arrive at prognosis. So I agree that anatomic staging classifications can't begin to bring in the variables such as mutational analysis, LVI, extracapsular invasion, length, et cetera, all the things that we had talked about with these variables that I wanted to include that I thought were important, especially for early stage disease, length, LVI, et cetera. Uh, didn't shake out, but I think it does make a difference in prognosis. Thank you.